Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's session. Um, my name is David Leon Sindika. I'll be the moderator for today's session. Um, I'll be filling in for Mr. Gabriel Chai. And um, today's session is on regulating the gig economy in East Africa, reassessing and rethinking the role of employment and competition law. Um, we would like to welcome you all. Thank you for joining. We are happy to have every one of you here. And we already have um, a stellar panel that is ready to um, share the experience and knowledge um, with us concerning the topic. And um, this will proceed for the next two hours. And from there, you'll get to hear from each one of the, from each one of the panelists on this topic, and hopefully you'll be able to gain something insightful out of this. To um, before I proceed, I just wanted to invite you all to uh, make use of the Q and A function of, in order to send out your questions or you could also reserve them. And during the Q&A session, we'll be able to, uh, the panelists will be able to address any of the questions that you may have. Today's Today's um, panelists include Ms. Irene Kashindi, Dr. Goodluck Temu, and Ms. Vera Kigwiru. Before I get to introducing them, I would like to give you a bit of an introduction that will help you stay engaged throughout the session and hopefully um, make you want to learn more on this topic. In the words, of course, of Ms. Vera, uh, is gig work a curse or a blessing for emerging economies? On the one hand, gig economy platforms offer the promise of employment opportunities, both at local and international um, levels for workers in emerging markets. On the other, the way that gig work is organized potentially raises a host of employment, competition, and consumer law challenges if left unregulated. Today's session is meant to equip lawyers with the right tools to navigate the dynamic changes in the digital economy that we are in. Um, so moving on to our first panelist for today, who is Ms. Irene Kashindi. Ms. Irene Kashindi is an advocate of the, High Court of, of the High Court of Kenya with over 15 years experience. She's a partner in Munyao, Muthama and Kashindi Advocates. She previously was a partner in Hamilton, Harrison and Matthews. Irene specializes in commercial and civil litigation and has an extensive Subspecialization in employment and rebel relations. She has recently um, been appointed as a member of the Committee of Experts of the International Labor Organization, ILO, on application of conventions and recommendations. She is also adept in arbitration and is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, UK and Kenya. Irene's other practice areas are insolvency, tax, and public procurement, and she was a board member of the Public Procurement and Administrative Review Board. She was the recipient of the Lawyer of the Year um, Second Runners-Up Award by the Law Society of Kenya Nairobi branch in 2020. She's a co-author together with George Kashindi of the Kashindi's Employment Digest, two volumes of 2020 and 2023. She's the LSK representative in the Employment and Labor Relations Court Rules Committee. 
She has been top ranked in band one by the prestigious leader, legal director, chambers and partners since 2017 to 2023 in the employment category. She has also been ranked as recommended lawyer and key individual in employment by Legal 500 from 2018 to 2024. She was the winner of the Client Choice Awards litigation in Kenya in 2018. And she has been quoted by clients acclaiming her as thorough and very professional, goes above and beyond what is required, and that she also has an in-depth hands-on experience dealing with emerging issues, and this makes her stand tall, lauded as one of the employment field's most prominent lawyers. She has been a resource person and has appeared as a speaker and trainer at the Law Society of Kenya, CPD programs, Judiciary Academy, client training programs, among other seminars and conferences. Um, Ms. Irene, we are very honored to have you today and um, I would like to invite you to uh, share your presentation with us in the next 30 minutes. Of course, your, um, your presentation would like to ask you to, in your presentation, to address the legal and policy issues pertaining to the regulation of gig economy. We would like to particularly learn from your experience and also from the international labor organizations approach and anything else you'd like to share with us today. Thank you, Irene, um, you're welcome. Thank you so much, uh, David, for that introduction. Um, and a very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, who have uh, joined the platform today. So uh, for the next 30 minutes or so, allow me to just share some um, you know, knowledge that I have uh, gathered in my experience of 15 or 16 years or so. Uh, in practice uh, as a as a labor and employment law practitioner in Kenya, and most recently in my engagement as a, a member of the ILO Committee of Experts um, uh, from late last year. Uh, the gig economy, or um, actually maybe one part of my focus today will be really classification of, uh, or sometimes misclassification of workers in the gig economy. And, and that that um, is an area that I've had an interest in um, from from uh, the issue of classification, not necessarily gig economy, because gig economy is more of a reason thing, but the issue of classification of workers or misclassification of workers, it's not something that started yesterday, it's something that has been in our laws, it has been something that is from the common law perspective, as we will see the control test and other multiple tests in as far as classification of workers is concerned. But more recently, we are now talking about classification of workers in the platform economy. I'll, I'll, uh, because now that's the time that when I would be focusing on regulation of the gig economy. So it's something that I've paid keen interest on um, for a number of years, and hopefully we can make it as interactive as possible so that you can also share your insights um, from how it is that you have uh, experienced these uh, issues that, as they keep emerging. Uh, so let me go straight to um, a few things. I, I think all of this was read about my, my bio. Um, allow me to talk about the, our books. <laughs> and now that I have this platform, um, Kashidi's Digest of Employment Cases. Uh, we've had people actually asking for it from Uganda, even Tanzania. So anyone from our East African countries, um, if you'd like to get this uh, uh, you know, collection of cases from a Kenyan perspective, but since Kenya is a common law country, we, we, the, the decisions that are collected in these volumes are, are, would actually also be relevant in wherever jurisdiction you're coming from. So that is our volume one that we released in 2020 and then volume two that we released in 2023. So to the order of the day, uh, which is uh, what uh, are we talking about? The gig economy. So that is my short outline that I will take uh, us through. I'll talk about introduction, the gig economy. I would imagine all of us or some of us have a good understanding. Maybe not all of us have the same level of understanding. So we'll go a bit of rudimentary and start to talk about what's gig economy, what is the digital labor platform, and then I'll take a bit of a deep dive of worker classification in the, in the digital labor platforms. Then I'll do a bit of a comparative analysis of what other countries are doing. I'll talk about the East African perspective, but obviously the Kenyan perspective, which I'm more aware of. And then I'll, I'll ask two questions, um, and then I'll end with uh, what then is happening at the air knowing as far as the platform uh, economy or platform work is concerned. Um, 
so then what, what is really the gig the gig economy uh, i think and, and many terminologies are used you could hear about platform work you could hear about uh, the gig economy freelance economy and and all these words are, are being used interchangeably but they, they more or less uh, mean really a, a collection of markets and most most of the time technological platforms that match providers with consumers on a gig and that's why i think this word gig we've used it a number of times I mean, in many contexts, but we are talking about this gig economy from a technological platform most of the time, though, you know, gig economy can also be offline, but you're talking about a technological platform that, you know, matches uh, providers to consumers. So you're talking about your your Glovo, you're talking about your, your, your Uber. I think Uber is the one that is most common because it's the one that has, I think, attracted a lot of litigation across from the other countries. But we're talking about your, your, your you know, uh, transport and uh, um, service providers uh, from, uh, you know, uh, Little Cab. I'm just trying to use the ones that are in Kenya so that um, we all understand what we are talking about. Um, but then what has led to the growth of the gig economy in the, in the recent past? It's really about technological advancement and digitalization across the globe, globalization, which has then led to increased connectivity and also mobility in the workforce such that uh, you, you could be here, but you're working for, and I think we've talked about, we, we've heard a lot about, um, um, you know, virtual uh, work nowadays, uh, remote work uh, that you could be and you're working in a different conti continent. Uh, so we are talking about all that decrease in uh, conventional job opportunities. That's what we're talking about, such that it's not, it's not your usual, it, we are not just in that uh, era where you do an eight to five job and, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a fixed locality, but you're talking about the platform work. And also um, literature review uh, actually indicates that also the entrance of the, gener the two generations, the millennials and the Gen Zs uh, into the workforce who have more preference for flexibility, especially the Gen Zs, yeah, I would say that, um, um, that they have more flexibility, they have more preference to flexibility and therefore more um, appetite for working in the platform economy, but also increased of the increased use of technology uh, during and also during the, uh, during and also in the aftermath of the COVID pandemic, uh, such that we've seen a lot of, uh, you know, appetite for that, but also from, an, from, an, from a business perspective, the cost of efficiency for businesses is what has really some of the factors that are responsible for the growth of the gig economy in globally in all in all in all markets. Um, uh, now then, that brings us to the labor law uh, space, such that the gig economy workers and I will call them platform workers. I'll call them gig economy workers. I mean more or less the same thing. Uh, the gig economy workers have more flexibility and independence. And uh, when I saw this quote, I, I, I thought it really captures the flexibility and independence that gig economic workers uh, have. Where mm -hmm. Brian Rashid was saying mm -hmm. that if that you can't drive an Uber in the morning, mm -hmm. design my mm -hmm. all afternoon. Mm -hmm. I, I can't, I can't mm -hmm. ask mm -hmm. to have their mic on, kindly switch them off, kindly. So to avoid uh, interruption, thank you so much. Um, so what I was I saying, I was just quoting Brian Rashid who says, who says you can't drive an Uber in the morning, design websites all afternoon and cater for your own food company at night. The old economy will lead you to, be, to believe that you should pick one job, work hard for the next 40 years at that company and then retire, not in the new economy. So it, it has brought a, a flexibility and independence. But uh, now that you're talking about labor law re regulations, um, the, 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 the increasing discussion and narrative, not only just locally, but even globally, is that then do these gig economy workers, um, are they really protected? Do they, or they, they do not ordinarily, unless there's legislation, do they do not ordinarily enjoy the benefits that um, accrue to employees? So you're talking about minimum wage, you're talking about uh, union uh, membership, you're talking about, about um, uh, you know, um, work, work health and safety, all the things, all the minimum uh, terms and conditions that accrue to employees do, do not ordinarily, you know, um, accrue to gig economy workers. And so when it, th that brings then us to the question as to then who, how do you classify gig economy workers or platform workers? How do you classify them? Are they employees? Are they self-employed? Are they self-employed? Are they independent contractors? And uh, where I was starting from where I was saying that I've, I've dealt with issues to do with classification of workers for many years, it, it has been from a point of, 
are, are employees uh, independent contractors or are they uh, or rather are individuals in a certain setting or if there's a litigation or a dispute are they employees or are they independent contractors and from a kenyan perspective and i believe we have borrowed this not really a borrowed we have adopted this from a from a common law perspective is that there's usually been a four-pronged test and actually maybe recently it has been now become five-pronged test of control that you are an employer if you uh, exercise control upon an individual uh, an individual is your employee if they are integrated to their to, to your business such that then then meet the integration test or uh, the business reality test and they also we also have had what we call mutuality of obligation such that you as an employer, you give certain um, um, terms and conditions and then the employee also expects something and vice versa. So there's con some, some certain consideration from a labor law perspective that passes from an employer to employee. And I think the fifth one that has increasingly uh, become common from our Kenyan perspective is what, what the courts or the judges have called the multiple tests. Such that we are, the courts have said, you're not looking at any one of this, you're looking at all of them to determine whether or not uh, that someone is whether whether or not an individual is an independent contractor or an employee. Now, this these um, principles from a common law perspective have now posed questions as to whether the current laws that we have and the current principles that we have, and I'm talking now here from a Kenyan perspective, and I imagine East African perspective as well, whether they deal with the realities of the changing job market, uh, the gig economy, as we are here to talk about, and. Uh, um, where then we are then increasingly seeing challenges um, uh, across the globe and disputes and case law across the globe where cases are arising of uh, misclassification of um, workers who are working on the independent on, on, on big uh, um, economies of platform work and, and and therefore then that brings us to sort of like a comparative analysis of what has happened in other jurisdictions so that we see what then we can say from our local East African perspective. Um, I think one of the most common cases that is widely quoted in as far as classification or misclassification of workers is concerned is this Uber decision by the court, by, by in the Supreme Court of, of, of um, UK. It started in the Employment Tribunal, it escalated to the Employment Appeals Tribunal, it further escalated to their Court of Appeal and their Supreme Court. And in all these levels, there was a determination that Uber drivers were workers and not independent contractors or self-employed. From from my I, and there was when the decision came out in 2021, I sat down and looked at it. I analyzed it. Uh, there's a whole article I've done on it. If someone wants to read it, I, I'm happy to share. Uh, and when I read it, I it, it actually led me to read the the legislation that was being uh, analyzed by all these levels of uh, judicial bodies. And I noticed that in the UK they have they have. Uh, um, sort of like three categories, if I'm not wrong. They have employees, but they have workers, and then they have, of course, independent contractors, as we all know them. So they sort of, they sort of um, a midway intermediate category called workers. And therefore, the decision here was whether these Uber drivers were workers, not necessarily employees, because workers under that legislation have some certain benefits, uh, such as minimum wage and holiday pay. And in the end, the court... The, all these judicial uh, uh, fora uh, ended up saying that they were actually workers and not self-employed uh, uh, individuals. And if you read that decision, you will see that um, um, that one of the, the turning point was really that Uber exercised control, control, and these drivers were subordinate to Uber drivers. Um, so you, you see, we go back to those principles of common law, which the court, I think, was still uh, applying here. Um, we also, um, liter literature review also indicates that most recently, uh, from a European Union perspective, the, uh, um, the U U European Parliamentary Council reached a provisional agreement, uh, which they call the Platform Work Directive, which really aims to improve working conditions of, for people uh, performing platform work. And uh, so these are, these are discussions that, are, I mean, these are some, some developments that are happening because there have been discussion for many years as to what what level of protection should then be extended to these workers, and under these proposed rules, because it's still a proposal, uh, that uh, the, the proposal is that there will be a presumption of an employment relationship when two out of the uh, two of out of these five indicators of control or direction are present. One, 
upper limits on the amount of money workers can receive. So there's that limitation as to, are you, are you controlling how much they can receive? Supervision of their performance, including by electronic means, we are going back to the issue of control. Control over the distribution or allocation of tasks. Fourth, control over working conditions and restriction of choosing working hours, and then restriction on their freedom to organize uh, their work rules uh, on their appearance or, or conduct. I'm just reading that because that's what we just picked from. I just picked from what it is that uh, these proposals are. So you will see that uh, from a European perspective, there are those discussions. Um, in South Africa, uh, we uh, also saw that some literature review and our case law also had to do with Uber. Uh, Uber South Africa Technological uh, Services, um, um, where there's a dispute as to whether those uh, drivers were, you know, could be classified as independent contractors and not employees. Sorry, not here. It was independent contractors and versus employees. Not necessarily uh, the same way the way the Uber decision was in the UK. And why am I trying to draw that distinction? Because you you will realize that when we come to this case law analysis, um, uh, the, the facts and the circumstances of which jurisdiction really differ, and therefore you might have one jurisdiction that classifies same workers in a certain way, but another jurisdiction classifies it in another in another way. So this one ended up being that uh, the, the the commissioner. Um, uh, of com the commissioner uh, of Con for conciliation and mediation and arbitration really ruled that uh, um, uh, uh, that uh, held that uh, that uh, Uber South African drivers are employees under South African law for reasons that they render their personal services to Uber. Their relationship to Uber is indefinite so long as the driver complies with the specified requirements. The Uber uh, the drivers are subject to control of Uber in the sense that they have to comply with clear performance standards. Uh, but this decision by the commissioner, because that was the first primary decision, was set aside by the Labour Court, and the status of Uber drivers then was said to be as independent contractors. So it started from the commission saying that they were uh, uh, employees, but that was set aside when then they moved um, um, up to, to, to escalated up to court. Now, I, 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 I must thank uh, Vera for, for, for uh, sharing some uh, information, which I picked from. I don't know that she was, able, she was planning to do that. But um, from the GI, uh, GIZ modules that um, um, she shared, uh, I picked maybe two or three things that are three other comparative analysis that I could share. Nigeria, within our own continent, uh, that in 2020, um, um, the Nigerian um, you know, legal system developed a regulation requiring ride hailing companies to obtain licenses to operate. The regulations also mandates the provision of insurance for workers and passengers, but the implementation of this has not been very consistent and it's been reportedly been patchy. In Spain, um, there, has been, uh, there has been recognition of food delivery workers. So it, it seems like jurisdictions are just picking some parts and pieces uh, out of this. Uh, hopefully we'll get harmonization at some point. But in Spain, they, um, Spain has recognized food delivery workers as employees under a law popularly known as rider law. So, but this has only been limited to, uh, you know, uh, food delivery workers and not other sectors uh, per se. Um, and then in Brazil, there's also been um, a proposal to consider something that is similar to Spain. And uh, in India, um, in 2020, the Indian government uh, introduced new labor codes that aim uh, to provide gig workers with some basic labor law or protection, or some, some protections that are keen to labor law protections, such as social security benefits. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't really record here in, in Kenya, but um, when I was doing my research, I, I, I found out that there is some reg regulations that are made under the, uh, let me just read the regulations themselves. They are known as the National Transport and Safety uh, Authority Transport Net Transport Network Companies Owners, Drivers and Passengers Regulations 2022. I must say that this is not a labor law legisla legislation or subsidiary legislation. It is really legislation made under the transport sector. And some um, provisions in it seem to mirror some social protections to a limited extent. To, to the to, to, to the uh, platform workers where for example there's limitation as to how long they can work before they take a break uh, we saw something in as far as that is concerned but it's very limited it is not that our employment and labor relations uh, you know primary legislation have been amended to, to deal with that it's more being dealt with from a 
regulatory perspective from our national transport and safety authority. So um, from there's really no specific legislation that has been made from at least a Kenyan perspective. And uh, our colleagues who are attending from an Eastern perspective, you can confirm as to whether there's any legislation that have now come into place to say gig economy workers are being classified in this manner or, or, or the other manner. It's, see, it's the, the prevailing position in Kenya is, is, is such that if it's such a dispute that would come to court, the common law principle that I talked about of test integration, mutuality, or the multiple test would be what would be applicable to confirm whether or not these are, um, you know, whether they're employees or whether they are independent contractors, whether they are self-employed or whatever other category you would give. Now, before I wind up and I let my other colleagues come in, um, I will pose questions. I may not necessarily answer them, <laughs> but I hope you can. Uh, we can be. We can. Uh, you know, uh, engage on the chat box or the Q and A to see what it is that your answers are. Um, and the first question really is that: Does the emerging work relationship fit within existing legal definitions of employee and independent contractor? Does it? Does the emerging work relationship in the platform work fit within the existing legal definitions? And we are talking about East African because we are now coming close home. Um, and why are we saying so? Um, because the gig economy workers have enhanced the flexibilities and independence, which are not characteristic to the conventional employee worker category. So on the one hand, there's those flexibilities and independence, but at the same time, they are dependent and subordinate to the technology uh, that the platform provider gives. So uh, with that, uh, uh, you know, realization that there's this existing and change. I'm so sorry, a changing existing um, work relationship. Then what should what should we do? And um, and 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 I think we can really agree that the current laws that we have, or even principles that have been applicable, that have been applied in the past, never really envisaged or ante anticipated fully the changes that we now experience. And um, as, as you will see in the next slide, as I try to wind up when I wind up on the iron law approach so far, um, is it is it now time to recognize um, the difficulty in applying the you know existing legal principles in, in the working in, in, in the in the in the work relationships with the new economy so that we start thinking about what else can we do? Uh, and is it time to then catch up? With the job market, in order to 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 because this this platform work have actually created employment. P platform economy has actually created a lot of employment in many jurisdictions, including our own in Kenya and even East Africa. But at the same time, can we what 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 can uh, case law enrich or even legal reform uh, come to bring into um, the, fill any gaps? So that we do not stifle innovation and the benefits that have come out of it, but we also deal with the challenges that have um, come up. And um, across the globe, especially, I think this is this is a discussion mostly. I think in the US, in the UK, um, that is there then a case for an intermediate category, such that we don't just have in the two in two two categories or in the spectrum. So I just don't have employees and independent contractors. But then is there a case to have an intermediate category that takes, uh, you know, um, advantage or uh, takes into consideration our new way of doing, uh, our new way of uh, working in the platform economy? And some of the, whether, whether you agree or not, I think that's something that we can discuss. But uh, some of the literature that we picked, uh, that I picked when we were doing this research is, for example, someone uh, classifying dependent contractor. So you remove independent, then you say dependent contractor. So this is a contractor that is dependent. And then what social protections or what other labor law protections can be extended to that uh, individual? Uh, there's that. And then uh, there's an independent worker. So it's just not an independent contractor, but also sort of like an independent employee, so to speak. So there's been so those discussions, uh, and I'm happy to share this uh, write-ups with you if you'd like us to. And finally, as I said, I mentioned an article that we did uh, from together with my colleagues in the firm when we were analyzing the Uber decision when it came up in the UK in 2021, which we are also happy to share. So last but not least, let me talk a, a little about what then is happening at the International Labour Organization. And I must say, 
when I sit in the committee of experts, we, we usually, um, what, what do you call it? <laughs> we, we give our views collectively, we have collective responsibility. So this is information that is publicly out there that I'm giving from uh, what ILO is doing. You could check their website right now, you will see that this is what um, is happening at the International Labor Organization. So I'm not speaking necessarily as representing what the committee is, is it has to say, because our mandate is very specific on what we do. Um, I know, um, so at the international level, ILO is undertaking a, a pathway towards development of a possible international labor standard on regulating platform work. And uh, when, so what we mean here, international labor standard is really whether conventional or recommendation. Uh, so there, there are discussions that are ongoing from an ILO perspective as to the creation or the coming up of an international labor standard regulating platform work because of all these things that we've talked about. And uh, discussions are scheduled in the calendar of the international labor conferences that are to, to that, that will happen in 2025 and 2026. And in preparation of this, what the ILO is doing is uh, that it has recently published um, a report uh, which provides an up-to-date information on way of sort of like a comparative analysis of how countries have been handling opportunities and challenges that the uh, gig economy has created. Uh, by, you know, uh, if you look at the report, you look at case law, you look at legislation, you look at uh, across the globe, really, and mostly, of course, in the, in the, in the, in the member states, but even outside the member states, uh, such that uh, it gives a very good analysis of what the current status is. And we, I'm happy to share it by, so it's, though it's on the ILO's website, but I'm happy to share the, 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 the link with you. But at the same time, even because this report is very recent, it was released on 31st of January this year, but even before that, ILO has been undertaking publications on digital labor platforms, which can be accessed on the, also on the website. And I'm happy to share the link with you. There's a lot of literature that ILO has put together uh, on, on a digital platform and what is happening in many jurisdictions. There's a whole write-up on case law from certain jurisdictions, which I'm also happy to share. I think I'll stop there so that I can let my colleagues take over and... Um, so over to you, David. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Ms. Irene, for your presentation I, and for setting that stage. I believe everybody has had the opportunity to understand, first of all, what gig economy is and has also been able to know uh, the situation in East Africa, but also that comparative analysis with the uh, UK, um, South Africa, and just really um, what is bringing all the changes in the current digital economy that we are in. Um, now we are going to move to the second panelist, who is Dr. Goodluck Temu. And before Dr. Temu begins, uh, I would like to tell you a bit about him. Dr. Goodluck Temu is a legal practitioner with extensive academic and professional experience. He holds, a, I mean, holding a bachelor and master's, master of laws degrees from the University of Dar es Salaam and a postgraduate diploma from the law school of Tanzania. He furthered his expertise with a PhD in telecommunications law from the University of Beirut in Germany. Dr. Temu is currently serving as a lecturer of law at the University of Dar es Salaam School of Law, where he teaches and supervises research at undergraduate and postgraduate le levels. Aside from teaching, Dr. Temu has provided consulting services and delivered lectures, seminars, and trainings on his area, on his areas of interest. He is also a practicing advocate of the High Court of Tanzania and a partner at Africa Patanis, a mid-sized law firm based in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Dr. Temu's knowledge and expertise includes telecommunications law, ICT law, competition and regulatory law, and banking and finance, where he has conducted substantial research and produced several peer-reviewed journal articles and a book chapter. He is an active member of the Tanganyika Law Society and East Africa Law Society. Dr. Temu also contributes to legal education as a board member of the University of Dar es Salaam School of Law. 
Dr. Tim, we are very honored to have you today with in this session. And I'd like to invite you to share with us your experience and knowledge um, of the Tanzanian experience in the regulation of the gig economy. We have heard from Ms. Irene, who has shared that um, um, the situation in Kenya and narrowly in East Africa. And um, would like to hear from you concerning the Tanzanian experience, mm. as well as any other um, information that you can share with us today. Thank you, and you're welcome. Hello, David. Thank you very much. And hello, good afternoon, everyone. As um, I have been introduced, my name is Goodluck Temu. I teach law at the University of Dar es Salaam, but I'm also a partner at Africa Tonys. I'll just share my screen for purposes of today's presentation. And I do hope that everyone is able to, to see what I am sharing. So I will speak a word or two about the regulation of gig economy in Tanzania. And I want to thank uh, the previous speaker, the pre previous presenter for a very wonderful presentation. She has actually given a very good um, uh, introduction background, so I do not need to go back and um, repeat the basics of uh, defining who is, a, who is a gig worker and how does it work. But it's important to understand that uh, the nature of gig or platform workers is that they, in most cases, work on a short-time basis and in one-time independent assignments. That's why we call them uh, side gigs. Uh, in some cases, these are uh, temporary workers, uh, so they're not permanent. They do not have permanent contracts. And um, in most cases, these are arranged in uh, three parties in the sense that there's um, a person who is offering services, a platform that organizes the availability of these services, and the client. In Tanzania, we have such arrangements. For example, the ride-sharing companies like Bolt, Uber, Little Ride, etc., are actively present in Tanzanian market. We also have um, on-call worker deliveries, for example, a big company known as Piki that is um, operational in Tanzania. Now, what is the problem are we facing here? So we have a sector or subsector, if one can take it that way, that employs a significant number of young people, mostly young people in the economy. So these people do uh, contribute significantly because they work, they earn a living, they contribute to the national coffers through their little tax that they have to pay. But then this huge number of persons do lack legal recognition. So we do not know exactly what do they do. Um, uh, we do not know whether we should categorize them as employees or independent uh, workers. And because of that, they also lack protection that is normally available to employees. The question that one should ask is whether we should care. And my answer is yes, by all means we should. This is because uh, their contribution into um, African economies and not only in African economies, but um, everywhere around the world is, is significant. One cannot ignore that. We understand in the African countries, we are struggling with unemployment and having a possibility of having these people participating in gig or platform arrangements means that we are addressing yeah, well, the unemployment you. problem. Congrats. Therefore, one, one should uh, not ignore uh, the role that uh, platform economy does address in uh, solving unemployment problem. In Tanzania, for example, there's so many young people um, some even with a university degree that are now working in as Uber or bond drivers. And, and therefore, uh, these are the people who would have been struggling in the streets without having anything to do, but it's now okay. they're having at mm -hmm. least an unemployment, whether it is formal no, or otherwise. Mean, well, that is, uh, uh, we found us so long ago. I mean, it takes that, through everything is, chance. Uh, that, that is the basis of our discussion today. So in the wider context, one can also argue that gig workers are human beings and therefore they should be protected as such. Their welfare as human beings must not be ignored. Just because they are not recognized as employees, one should not assume that they should not be protected uh, under the law. 
So when we look at the Tanzanian case, one then asks one important question, how can we protect platform and gig workers? I have four propositions that one can consider. Uh, this um, has to do with the presence of pro uh, provisions or articles in our constitution that might afford the much needed protection. We can also think of protecting them under contract laws, under labor laws, and you can also explore uh, into whether competition and uh, regulatory law can play a role. So can the constitution of Tanzania be of any help if one is to consider protecting the rights and interests of gig workers? My answer is yes. When you read Article 22, sub Article 1 of the Constitution of Tanzania, it says that every person has the right to work. So every person, including these platform workers, have the right to work. Article 23, sub Article 1 reads that every person without discrimination of any kind is entitled to re remuneration commensurate. Uh, uh, with his work, and all persons working according to their ability shall be remunerated according to the measure and qualification for the work. 23, sub article 2, reads that every person who works is entitled to just remuneration. So this one addresses one question of uh, fair remuneration, but then one can look at it as a framework provision or a framework directive that guides on the right compensation. So these, these gig workers, we understand that one of the problems they're facing is, uh, do they get enough pay? Is it a fair, uh, a fair work? Is it a decent, uh, do they have a decent working condition? Do they get paid uh, in comparison to the uh, number of hours that they put into, into their services? So you can, although this is not a very direct provision from the constitution, but one can argue that it provides a framework from which then one can think of developing a clear framework of protecting these particular groups of persons. One can also think of a law of contract, uh, whether uh, platform workers, for example, can enter into a contract with those uh, uh, platform owners uh, to the extent that their rights and uh, interests are secured, um, they're protected. Now, under normal circumstances, one can be tempted to argue that this is correct, uh, but then it is important to understand that uh, the freedom of contract uh, concept is much applicable in Tanzania. And therefore, when you have a young person who has nothing to, um, to eat, you know, when he has a, possi a possibility of working with Uber or Volt or as a delivery person, he or she might think of, uh, she might not be in a position, position to think of other interests apart from the fact that he or she is going to earn a living. And therefore, these people may be entering into contracts that are not fair or they have not yet fully understood them. Yet, because of the concept of the freedom of contract, they will have nothing to do against those contracts that they have signed. And you will all agree that the institution of contract in African countries is not as strong mm -hmm. as in the developed countries in the West or the global North. And therefore one cannot really rely on the contractual terms as a means of protecting their interests. Under normal circumstances, that should be the position but then taking into account other factors that affect um, how contracts and the institution of contract works in African countries, Tanzania inclusive, then it might be doubtful that, um, it may be doubtful if one thinks that uh, contract law by itself should be sufficient to address these things. And of course, you also have to consider questions like information symmetry, for example. Uh, these uh, platform owners know a lot of things. They they use algorithms. They have leveraged uh, information. They can. Uh, they, they 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 know so much that um, an ordinary person in in a certain region of Tanzania is not aware of. So you cannot uh, take into account the inequality of parties. You cannot assume that these are uh, equal parties entering into a contract uh, with fair terms and conditions. Maybe one can also think of collective bargaining as a solution. So this uh, ends up being a contractual provisions where these workers collectively bargain on better terms. That is a possibility, but experience from other sectors of the economy uh, tells us that uh, collective bargaining are not so effective uh, in, in Tanzania, of course, because of the 
complicated nature of the relationship between employers and employees. And then the question would be, can we then um, focus on uh, labor laws, employment and labor relations law? Yes, one can also think of it as a possibility. In Tanzania, we have two uh, um, major acts that uh, govern employment matters. We have the Employment and Labor Relations Act and the Labor, uh, Labor Institutions Act. Of course, there are several other regulations made under these laws. Uh, but the Employment and Labor Relations Act is, is not very helpful here because it governs the relationship between an employer and an employee. And as a condition, there must be a contract of employment. So for you to be protected under the Employment and Labor Relations Act, you have to be, um, there has to be a, a, a proof that you are an employee. And we understand that most of gig workers are not employed by these platform workers. So they cannot uh, seek refuge under the Employment and Labor Relations Act. But we have the Labor Institutions Act, Chapter 300, Revised Edition of 2019, Section 61, provides for presumption of employment. And I will read it. It says, for the purposes of, a lab of labor law, a person who works for or renders services to any other person is presumed until the contrary is proved to be an employee, regardless of the form of the contract, if any one or more of the following factors is present. So there's a long list of, not very long, but there's a list of factors that have to be considered if you want to presume that someone is an employee. Now, if you go through these factors, you might be in a position to say probably uh, gig workers or platform workers uh, can qualify as employees. But before one is quick and to, to, jump, to jump into that conclusion, you have to read again the wording of section 61. So section 61 says, until the contrary is proved. So if these factors are met, but the contrary is proved, then one cannot claim to be an employee. And um, if, for example, you claim to be an employee, but it is proved that you have no formal employment relationship, then you may not be able to get uh, the much needed protection under this law. But for the interest of those who are present here, I will just go through those factors. So number one, you might be presumed uh, an employee of a certain person organization um, if the manner in which the person works is subject to the control or direction of another person. We can ask ourselves whether ball drivers, Uber driver, delivery persons fit into this uh, factor. Then whether the person's hours of work are subject to the control or direction of another person. Well, it has been argued here that uh, these platform workers choose when to work and how to work. They can work in the morning, do something else at night. Ideally, this is how it ought to have worked. And I think even those who came up with the idea of um, having Bolt, Uber, Little Ride, Faras, uh, all those are uh, 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 programs that, that, that work in Tanzania. They, I'm not sure whether they had foreseen the possibility of some people taking this as a full-time job. So the way it was introduced, even the way Uber came to Tanzania, was that I have my car, I'm, I'm, I'm going to town, I just need to put the app on, so whoever needs a ride to town, we can share. And I think this is how it still works in many uh, European countries, if I am not mistaken. So there was no presumption or uh, contemplation that uh, there will be some people who from morning to evening, they are working as Uber drivers. Unfortunately, that is what is happening in, in Tanzania and in many other parts of, of, of developing countries. So one can argue that uh, Uber, Bolt, uh, delivery platform, somehow they have a control of how many hours a person works. And with the introduction of our logarithms, if you are not, if you are not often available or if you decline requests, uh, the platform can even kick you out because you are, you, you're not committed into delivering your safety. So indirectly, one can argue that these platform owners, platforms themselves, they do control how uh, platform workers work for how long they should work. 
And then see it says in case of a person who works for an organization, the person is part of that organization. Of course, this does not work. Uh, the person has worked for that other person for an average of at least 45 hours per month over the last three months. I think this is, uh, it fits the bill. The person is economically dependent on the other person for whom that person works or renders services. I think this is um, the sad truth that um, uh, is, is, is happening in African countries, Tanzania inclusive. So we thought that um, uh, 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 these will be just gig works, you know, side works. But now these are like full-time employment. So people rely on Bolt, rely on Uber for their, uh, for to, to earn a living. Uh, F says the person is provided with tools of, of trade or work equipment by the other person. This does not work. Um, or maybe it depends on the type of uh, platform work. And the person only works for or renders services to one person. Again, this is a question of fact. So section 61 can be interpreted to uh, provide a possibility of recognizing platform workers as employees. But then this needs to be tested in um, our courts to see how our judges are going to decide. Uh, because if you, uh, so long as we have not tested it, uh, we remain to be speculative as to whether these platform workers can be covered by Section 61. One can also think of uh, protection available under competition and regulatory laws. Uh, and here, one can argue that sector regulators may intervene to regulate for better terms and conditions. A few years ago, LATRA, this is a um, re regulator for land transportation in Tanzania, I decided to increase commissions available for uh, Uber and, and Bolt drivers, uh, meaning that uh, drivers were now retaining more than they had previously they were previously receiving, and that meant that uh, platform owners were receiving less than they were receiving before the intervention. What happened is that uh, Bolt Uber decided to leave Tanzanian market, and followed by Uber. And the reasons were the reasons cited were that uh, the working environment were difficult; they were not making profit, and therefore you can see a very good intention of uh, regulators trying to intervene and ensure better and fair terms and conditions for these platform workers. But then these platform owners are very big; they are giants, and they can decide to leave the market um, uh, without um, uh, without any serious implication because they'll be uh, able to operate elsewhere. And therefore, uh, uh, LATRA had to succumb and revise their proposal. Now, that was one uh, unfortunate scenario where one expected that the regulator uh, would be able to flex, uh, be able to flex. Uh, its masses against these platform uh, owners, these platforms, but yeah, it didn't work. And um, the way I look at it, uh, one could uh, have approached what Uber and Bolt did uh, from the competition perspective. Maybe Vela will comment it um, at a later stage. Perhaps this was a refusal to supply, you know, and these two were dominant in the market. Um, I don't know. Vela, Vela would be in a very good position to comment on it. But you can see, um, and, and I think elsewhere when we were doing presentation, we noted that uh, most of these platforms have been developed from the global north and they are working in the global south in the sense that they are operating in African countries, developing countries. Uh, in other, in the European countries, there's a lot of um, uh, regulations that help uh, to control what is happening. But here, those regulations are not in place and therefore uh, we, the global south, work for the benefit of those uh, of the north, and uh, we can also see geographical inequality taking into uh, shape. Uh, maybe we should also think of permitting or encouraging collective bargaining by gig workers in order to negotiate better terms. And competition law can also work to regulate anti-competitive and exploitative practices by dominant platforms. So if we understand, if we perceive or we have done our research and conclude that Uber, Bolt, and other dominant platforms are uh, uh, offering exploitative, uh, they engaged in exploitative practice that might harm 
uh, these users, maybe and maybe competition law can be innovative, you know, innovative enough to also address that. I understand that the traditional competition law may not be of the assistance, but with the situation in the problem at hand, it might be a better position to rethink uh, what our competition and regulatory laws um, uh, can do. Uh, what must be done? In my opinion, I think whether we want it or not, the time is now ripe for us to recognize these people from, uh, to, to, to recognize them in our relevant labor laws. I understand there might be a debate on, okay, these are not employees, how can we recognize them? But my argument is that if necessary, we can even invent the will. We can think of of, of, of coming up with a very good framework, very good regulatory framework, that um, very good regulatory framework that might uh, uh, might address their, their problems. Uh, number two, I am proposing for the adoption of wider uh, government policies that recognize and support them. So the way it is now in Tanzania, it's like this uh, is a neglected group of persons. They, they, they just take care of themselves. Uh, think of a person who is driving an Uber, for example. So this person in most cases is not the owner of this vehicle. So there's a contract between him and the owner of this uh, contract. And then there's a contract between him and the platform. There's so many things that come into uh, question here. For example, in case of accident, who is responsible? Uh, in case he has been um, injured in the, in the in the course of duty and he is unable to work, maybe he has suffered permanent injury. Uh, how, how, how are we going to think and um, provide a, a much needed social protection to this person because he was not recognized anywhere. These people do not have health insurance because no one knows what they're doing. Whatever they're doing is not legal. Uh, I mean, whatever they're doing is, is legal, but it's not recognized. So I'm, I'm not sure if uh, there's a possibility of someone going and say, okay, I'm an Uber driver. I want to get this type of insurance based on my work as an Uber driver. That is very difficult. But even accessing financial services, you know, when you go to a banker, can you say my work is an Uber driver. I am a delivery person so that you recognize and you can also get assistance from the financial institutions. So I, I think there is a need and I am proposing for the adoption of wider government policy that will recognize this particular group of persons and provide for their interests, for their safety, for, for, for their protection. And, and in my opinion, I would argue that this should go beyond looking at their working conditions. We, we need to go beyond that. We need to look at these persons as a group of persons, which is, in my opinion, vulnerable, and it needs to be specifically protected by our laws. And I would also argue for a more robust regulatory approach. So uh, these, these, these um, platform workers, they work in different uh, industries that are regulated, and we have regulators. And the last time I checked, regulators in Tanzania as in many African countries, are very powerful. They can do so many things. I would argue that this is the time we look at our uh, regulators and task them with powers to regulate more. I understand those who are coming from the competition perspective would argue that more regulation is bad. But here is where I would say it is a justifiable regulation. So we need to regulate because there's so much at stake. And if we leave this without regulation, we'll have a very big uh, section of our society engaged in um, um, maybe informal or unrecognized activity, and they're just left there as orphans. And even in terms of uh, economic development, apart from uh, uh, provision of employment, I would also think that a proper regulation would then lead into even collection of more revenue because we recognize them, they would have to pay tax if they meet their provided threshold in tax laws, et cetera, et cetera. So in my opinion, I think uh, I'll conclude by saying that uh, we have gig workers in Tanzania. They are there. These platforms are keeping on increasing day by day. 
so many people are employed uh, in, in these platforms, employed in courts, because when you look at it technically, maybe they're not. Uh, because of that, we cannot ignore what is happening, but rather it's a time now we take step, we take initiative to address this, um, uh, let me call it problem. David, thank you very much. I think that will be it from my side. And thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Tim. That was a wonderful presentation and um, we really appreciate. And I think uh, some of the key takeaways on um, this, on, on what must be done is ensuring that relevant labor laws are updated, ensuring that um, there's wider government policy and that there's um, adoption of in, in, in this in order to ensure that there's better conditions for gig workers, not just in Tanzania, but of course in other parts of the African countries as well. Um, uh, now, um, we'd like to move on to the next panelist. And uh, this is Miss Vera Kedogo Kigwiru. Uh, before she takes the stage, I would like to tell you a bit more, a, a bit about her. Uh, Ms. Vera Kedogo Kigwiru is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. She's currently a doctoral, fellow, a doctoral research fellow at the Technical University of Munich, uh, TMU, School of Social Sciences and Technology. She's a guest researcher at Max Planck Institute for Innovation and Competition, Munich, um, Germany. She's a Marie Jahoda Visiting Fellow at the University of Cambridge, UK, and an Associate Research Fellow at the Digital Futures at Work Research Center, University of Sussex, UK. She's also a contributing editor at Afronomics Law and a researcher at Unitat Research Partnership Platform on Competition Policy. Currently, she works as competition law consultant for GAZ on a project focusing on the potential and limits of competition law in protecting gig workers' working conditions. Previously, she worked at the Competition Authority of Kenya and taught a course on competition law and policy in emerging markets at the Technical University of Munich in Germany. Kugiru's research interests focus on competition law and policy, consumer protection, labor law, technology and innovation, international economics law, trade law, regional integration, human rights and legal research methods in a comparative perspective. She has researched in the Oxford Journal of Antitrust Enforcement, Manchester Journal of International Economic Law, African Journal of International Economic Law, and the Cambridge University Press. Um, Ms. Vera will discuss the potential and limits of competition law in regulating the the gig economy, and she'll also share with us the GIZ online course models and um, any other relevant information. Ms. Vera, you are welcome to proceed with your presentation. We are very honored to have you here with us today. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm honored to have this opportunity to speak um, to this session with all the East African Law Society members, and also for the other participants that are joining from Nairobi under my link. So uh, thank you so much, Irene and Temu for your presentation. And I learned a lot from Irene's presentation regarding all the regulatory approaches that different countries have adopted, including what the Global North has adopted. And we can observe that when it comes to African country, there's um, limited regulatory approaches across all our countries. 
apart from what we've seen Temu talk about, what the Tanzanian transport uh, institution, LATRA, has done so far. And also in Kenya, our Ministry for Transport also came up with some commission rates, uh, commission cap um, in 2022, I think, which was capped at 18% requiring all um, apps operating in the right alien market to limit the commissions. So today I'm going to talk about the potential of competition law, which uh, Dr. Goodluck has um, briefly mentioned. And I'm also going to introduce you to a number of eight courses that the GSZ has created, which identify all the potential and legal uh, regulatory frameworks. And I think the first thing I should do is to share the GSZ online courses. I've shared the link uh, in the chat. So if you've not seen the link, I can also share so that um, if you're having a phone, you can just click on it and then all of us can go to the JZ website. So the number of issues that previous speakers have raised, issues pertaining to what is gig work, what are the regulatory approaches that different countries should adopt, issues relating to the classification of these workers, are they employees, are they third employed people, and Aiden has mentioned, are they a third category of workers that should be differentiated differently? Uh, we've mentioned issues related to different regulatory approaches. It can, contract law can apply as Tim has shown, labor law, competition law, and also data protection, consumer protection as well. So I always say it's a multidisciplinary approach and it will also depend on which side you are. So as an employment lawyer, if you have a case and you need to defend the platforms, this, you have to understand what are the legal issues pertaining, how the platforms um, infer whether those working for them are employees or self-employed people. If the gig worker comes to you and they argue that they are employees and they need the protection, they need the labor benefits to be extended to them. How are you going to prove to the court that your client is an employee and not a self-employed person? And um, if Irene uh, shares her presentation with us, it will be very good if we look at the description she has given regarding the UK Supreme Court, which based its decision on the control test. So let's have a look on the GAZ courses before we move down to discussing the role of competition law in regulating the gig economy. So this program will provide you with an opportunity to identify the challenges and opportunities that are in the gig economy. The courses are free and you get a certificate at the end of the course. And it's very simple. We made it so simple so that even the gig workers as um one of one of our presenter in the previous session that I had regarding the Zambian gig economy mentioned that um, in one of her projects, I'll share the report um, in the chat, she found that uh, most of the workers didn't have a degree and others were high school dropouts, especially those that are participating in the ride alien app market. Therefore, we made it, um, we made sure that this course is very simple for everyone to take it. It's not limited to elites. Business people can do it. The gig workers who uh, maybe they have high school um, education can still do this course. So it's very simple. Share it with everybody um, in your network. So this is the experts that have been working on and I was brought on board in order to provide the African insights in regulating the gig economy. So once you complete this course, you'll be able to have a deep understanding of the gig economy from different perspectives, from different countries. And as um, Irene mentioned, most countries are um, adopting different approaches. There are those that are defining the workers as self-employed and there are those that are um, defining them as employees. And when she talked about the EU platform directive, it has become so political as some countries, including Germany, 
have been against the EU platform directive. So it's a very political issue and it will depend on the political willingness of countries to adopt specific regulatory approaches for the gig economy. And in the African context, the impact of power dynamics come into play because most of these platforms are regulated in the global north. And even when they operate in the African um, countries, they don't have any physical presence. So in addition to issues related to the classification of the workers, we are also going to have issues related to the jurisdiction uh, when litigating issues pertaining to the GIGACOM. So you're going to have a deep understanding of all these issues. And you're also going to join a network of experts because we, we share most of our events online and we collaborate with a lot of um, institutions, including the East African Law Society in creating awareness. So we have eight courses. So the first module on the rise and economics of digital labor platform, it delves in, into the concepts of the gig economy, including what is gig work, what are the types of gig work, we have crowd work, we have work on demand. Uh, the difference is that both of them, you get your job through the internet, you request for a job. But then um, what happens is that under crowd work, you work remotely. So if you are working with app work, you work remotely from where you are. And then work on demand is what we are talking about, the food delivery platform, the red ailing app. So the worker gets the job through the platform, but then they have to deliver um, the work on a specific location. Module two will take you through um, all the regulatory approaches that different countries have adopted including a government approach, judicial intervention, such as um, the UK Supreme Court. Uh, we also have Uruguay, Spain. Uh, at the, at, when it comes to Global South, what India has done so far, Malaysia, Thailand, and so on. So module three, on the other hand, looks at the legal status of platform workers in this changing landscape. It focuses on the definition of with the gig work, but also on the employment status of the gig workers. Module four will take you through the working conditions of gig workers and how different countries have been able to extend labor protection to these gig workers. So issues related to low pay, limited insurance, limited right to collective bargaining, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And then module five, as I said, um, this is not just um, an issue relating to employment law. We are also talking about the digital market ecosystem, where data is a critical input for their success. So, for platforms that are able to amass as much data as possible, then they have a competitive advantage over the specific platforms. Therefore, you are going to learn about the value of data and also how algorithms play a role in the gig economy uh, ecosystem, including controlling the gig workers. So in most cases and in most um, uh, case law that is emanating, you find that um, most jurisdictions are looking at uh, how these platforms are using the algorithms to exercise substantial control to these workers. So this is what you're going to learn uh, in, this, in this module. Module six, which I was the expert that uh, drafted this, we take you through the characteristics of the digital market ecosystem that is very different from the traditional market ecosystem that we know. For instance, digital market ecosystem have what we call network effects, which simply means that the value of the platform increases with the number of users that are on that platform because these platforms play an intermediary role. So you, one, one end of the end users would want to be on this platform because they can find the other users on this platform. A good example is the taxi industry, whereby drivers will want to be on a platform where they can get customers. So a platform that is able to drive traffic to its platform and bring all the users on that platform will have a competitive advantage over other platform. 
a network effect is a bar to entry into markets because if you are a new platform and you want to enter into this specific market, and we'll give you an example of the Kenyan right alien market, whereby we have um, more than, sorry for that, we have more than 20 platforms in the Kenyan market, but users um, are locked in on only two platforms. That is Uber Bolt with some of them now using InDrive or LittleCup. But then we have Maramoja, we have Farasi, and so on. So because Uber and Bolt already have users, and we are already used to those platforms. So as a customer, you're already used to Uber and Bolt. It's so hard for you to even use another platform that has entered into the market, maybe not only because of consumer preference, but also security issues related. So it becomes so difficult for other platforms to enter into the market when network effects are present. And another characteristics of this market, um, I've talked about data aggregation as a second uh, characteristics. And the third characteristic is what we call the first mover advantage or winner takes it all. So the first mover advantage simply means that um, the first one to enter into the market has more competitive advantage over the others. It, it can be because of the data aggregation, the network effects, the consumer preferences of using a specific platform. So those are that. And then we are also going to take you through the competition issues uh, within this platform. There's a number of competition issues um, that have been raised in the digital labor platform market. And one of them will be cases of predatory pricing where certain, certain platforms are charging uh, their prices too way low below the cost of production. And it becomes so hard for other platforms to compete over that specific price. And in predatory pricing, uh, firms will lower prices not because they want consumers to get um, uh, cheap, cheaper, cheaper products or cheaper prices in the market, but because they want to gain market power and exclude other participants from the market. And once they've been able to achieve that, they've been able to exclude other participants, then they increase their prices in order to recoup the losses. That is the number of anti-competitive um, concerns we are having in this market. And secondly, we have issues relating to price fixing, where platforms are agreeing over the commission fees, the booking fees, the service fees, which is really per se illegal. So we'll take you through all those um, anti-competitive conduct, also issues related to market allocation. And um, this one happens uh, when certain platforms ask the gig workers to only work for them. And you know, because the gig workers are integral to the success of us platforms, if you are a new platform and you cannot access the gig workers, it simply means you'll not be able to attract the other clients on your platform. So it becomes very important. Then we'll also look at um, what other jurisdictions have done in, in relation to extending the labor exemption under competition law. So this one, I'll give you more details um, in the presentation I'm going to make after this. And then taxation of platform and workers is a very important uh, issue that um, those of us who focus on tax law should know. Uh, in Kenya, I think it's now 16%. In Uganda, they also have taxation of digital platforms. Tanzania, I think they have not yet uh, come up uh, with the taxation regime, but these are some of the issues we are going to look at as we embark on this journey. So I believe that as lawyers, it's important to know the issues related to taxation of platforms and workers. Mm -hmm. And finally, the gig economy should be a market ecosystem whereby everyone can participate in this market including people with disability and women. And women face many challenges when it comes to entry of any uh, specific market. So in this regard, module eight will take you through this. So if you want to do a module, you can start from anywhere, but I'll, let you, I'll ask you to, uh, to do module one and two first, and then you can move with the other modules depending on your interest. So let's say you want to do module six, so you click on the module, then you can register here. I already registered, but then you scroll down to this end and you click here 
to enroll for the module because I've already enrolled for the modules. So I'll just uh, log in. So um, this is an online course. So you'll have um, some two people here, <laughs> Alex and Maria, to take, to take you through and explain to you some of the issues. So if you want to do the module, you just click here. And we have a quiz at the end of the module. So we'll, we'll, we'll give you a brief a description of what is happening. We make it enjoyable for you so that you can enjoy doing the course. So it's very simple. The labor exemption commission is not extended to DLP workers. So these are some of the issues we are looking at. And once you're done with all this, at the end of the module down here, you undertake your quiz. And if you get nine questions out of 21, you get your certificate at the end of it. So that is all about the course. So if I move to my presentation, so most of the issues that I had put uh, in the initial slides have already been addressed uh, by Irene. So I'll just uh, go through them very fast so that we can move to the core discussion. So we've discussed about the JZ uh, course module. So there's no point of repeating this. So I think by the end of this, we've been able to understand um, what is gig work. There is no precise definition of what is gig work, but um, you need to know that um, when it comes to gig work, what we are looking at is that uh, it's temporary and part-time work. Those involved in the gig work are independent contractors or freelancers, and they're only contracting for specific pay and specific tasks. So as Irene and Woodluck has mentioned, it's a flexible working arrangement that someone should decide when to do it and when to not to do it. And then we have three participants, the platform that acts um, as a mediator mediating between the gig work, the gig worker, and also the client who needs someone to do a specific task for them and pay them. Most, most of the time, uh, we talk about the taxi industry, but those who are in graphic design and entertainment, this is the kind of um, jobs that they're involved in. And then we've talked about the type, the crowd work, you do it remotely, and then the work on demand, you do it on a specific location. So in addition to what my colleagues have said, there's an increasing demand of gig bags from the global south. The reason is that the platforms that are established in the global north are able to get cheap labor. And they're in a position to exploit gig workers because most of them have no alternative as this one is their full-time job. Although they think they're self-employed, but you find that most drivers work only for these specific platforms. So there's also an increasing growth of homegrown digital platforms in emerging markets that are competing with international platforms that already have the first move advantage, network effects, and data that they got when they started their operations early. So they need to have a regulatory framework that looks at how these two types of platforms can compete in the specific market becomes very critical. And this is where the role of competition authority comes in. And then initially it was um, the taxi industry that had um, the gig, had, had most of the platforms uh, establishing in, uh, in, in African countries, but we can see gig workers working for the e-commerce, for Kenyans, Jumia, Kilimall, those are the kind of platforms we are talking about. The person who delivers a product to you, if they requested that, if they, go, they get that job through the Kilimall app, then, or whichever app that is there to provide them with the work, the gig workers. And then food delivery platforms, we've seen global operating in a number of African countries. And then we also have the FinTech sector. So 
With this, we've already talked about the regulation, why we need to do this. In addition, it enhances economic and social um, development, even sustainable development goals, especially reduction of poverty. But as my former colleagues have talked about the challenges, I will not go into details on the challenges. So the reasons we want to regulate um, the digital economy is also to ensure fair working condition and also to keep pace with technological advancement and development. And anytime I'm having guest lectures at the university level, I always advise the lecturers to always think about the digital perspective of whichever course you're teaching. And a legal practitioner, you also have to think about the digital issues in whichever area of practice you are practicing. So there are a number of regulatory concerns, I will not go through them as well, which uh, Irene and Goodluck mentioned them. The question of employment status of this gig work, it has been mentioned. And um, in addition to um, the global north and also South Africa, as Irene has mentioned, also in Nigeria, they have that case in the case of Oladipo, Olatunji and another, in which the Uber driver sought um, sought a prayer um, that would determine them as uh, employees. But the tribunal in, in Nigeria held that they're self-employed people, the specific case. And then in addition to that, the issue of uh, these workers working in very poor working condition is on the rise with a number of them protesting. A lot of them have been protesting against the commission rates. So this is one of the other regulatory concerns of whether we should extend the labor protection to these workers. And importantly, from a competition um, law perspective, there's, um, this is a very highly concentrated market with a few platforms having the market power, um, which they have gained uh, from data aggregation, network effects, and fast mover advantage. So you find the workers being tied um, in on few platforms, even when there are other better platforms. And I can give you the example of Diego when it was entering the Kenya market in 2022. It provided um, health insurance protection. It indicated that um, its commission rate was going to be at 12%. It was going to have a circle for the drivers if they joined. Yeah, it was providing better terms for the drivers, but then drivers will go where there's traffic. So because of the network effects and the fast move advantage you find, it's not easy for Yego to just penetrate the Kenyan market like that when other platforms have already penetrated the market. So those are the things we are talking about, which makes the workers um, become tied in in only few platforms, even when there are alternatives. And most importantly, finally, is that uh, these platforms are engaging in anti-competitive conduct. A number of competition agencies have had a chance to look into this. We just had an event with the Zambia Competition Commission, and they mentioned that um, they are investigating the right alien market in Zambia. And this anti-competitive conduct is both exclusionary and exploitative. Exclusionary in the sense that uh, certain and competitive conduct such as predatory pricing and uh, market allocation tend to exclude other participants from the market. So it becomes difficult for these participants to enter and penetrate. And ex ex exploitative, um, some of the competitive conduct that are exploitative is like unilateral conduct whereby these platforms can delist the workers um, without any justifiable reason. You wake up and you don't even have a job. So this is um, a GSA report uh, uh, taken in Rwanda in 2022, whereby one of the interviewees said that um, monthly payments do arrive for them, but they're subjected to regular working hours and they're reprimanded to work exclusively for one delivery platform. So this is um, a conduct of uh, unilateral uh, conduct and also market allocation, because if gig workers are very critical for the functioning of the gig economy, they should be allowed to work for whichever platform they want to work for. And also you look at it and you realize that they've, 
they feel, not only do they feel, but when you look at it, they're being treated as employees because they're getting a monthly payment, especially for countries um, beyond Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria, or Ghana, which have limited digital infrastructure. So you find that it's very easy to exploit the workers in these uh, specific countries. And none of them felt secure in the work arrangement as they noticed platform bringing in waves of new riders and even threatened to receive the veteran riders. So it, it's um, an issue of take it or leave it. At the end of the day, you need us more that we need you. So with, with, this, um, with this observation, with this observation, different countries have adopted legitimate approaches. I will not go through all of them. Some have reclassified the workers as self-employed. Judicial intervention has taken place in some countries. Others have extended the labor exemptions without reclassifying the gig workers as self-employed people. Denmark and China, China has extended the right to collective bargaining and others have introduced the employment status presumption. And I didn't talk about the EU platform directive. So others have taken legal framework. Irene talked about all this, but she didn't mention about Thailand, which has introduced the Independent Workers Protection Act. It's still, um, it's still a draft. So we'll see how it goes, whether they'll be able to adopt this. And also in addition to what Irene said regarding India, in addition to code of, the Code on Social Security, the state of Rajasthan adopted the Platform Based Gig Workers uh, Registration and Welfare Act, which has introduced also a welfare fund for the gig workers within um, this uh, market ecosystem. And then Good Luck talked about what Tanzania has done in relation to um, introducing directive that cap the commission rate to 15%. And it also eliminated booking fees that was uh, in March 2022, but then a number of um, platforms rejected this directive and Uber and Bolt suspended their services in Tanzania until when Latra entered into a discussion with them and it moved the commission rate from 15 to 25%. And it also reintroduced the booking fee up to 3%. And the argument when they were leaving, the, when they were suspending the services in Tanzania was like, that one will um, undermine their profits. 15% commission rate will undermine their profits. And also the Tanzanian business environment was not good for them. So as we talk about regulatory approaches, we are also looking at the unintended consequences that these regulatory approaches can have on business um, investment within the digital labor platform. Because we also want to enhance um, a conducive business environment. At the same time, we need we are we, we need to ensure that the gig workers are also are working under better working condition and they can also have uh, a decent income to take care of their families as well. So Nigeria mentioned about what happened in Lagos, but also Nigeria is the first country in Africa that has been able to register uh, a, a, gig, a gig workers organization as a trade union. So the Amal Amalgamated Union of Upbest uh, Transporters in Nigeria is now a trade union registered under Nigeria. So this provides um, the app-based transporters of Nigeria an opportunity to collectively begin for their better working conditions. So in a nutshell, the Ministry of Labor in Nigeria has extended the right to collective beginning to the platform workers, although now it's limited to the riding alien market. But once these um, kind of regulatory approaches are adopted, they're more likely to extend into other sectors. And I've already mentioned about um, Kenya's commission rate, which was capped at 18%. And those who are following, we remember Uber uh, going to court, uh, contenting uh, these uh, commission rate, and then the matter was settled out of court. But now it's like 18%. My discussion with drivers is that, okay, it's 18%, but the apps have also introduced the service and booking fee. I think one of it is seven and the other one is eight. So at the end of the day, the apps take home around 31 or 
from what you pay the Uber driver. So the consequence is we are having platform threatening to leave. We have some workers insisting that they are not employees, they should just be classified as self-employed people. And then as we introduce this regulatory framework, we might observe um, an increase in consumer prices because these costs are usually transferred to the, to the customers. So the many reasons exist why we are having a variation, and that's why, as um, Good Luck mentioned, we have to do this a case by case basis. We have to also um, monitor our markets before we adopt any regulatory approach. So there's issues related to political considerations. If you are following the EU platform directive, a number of countries are resisting that um, directive. We have we have to consider the level of unemployment and unemployment and also the degree of our digital infrastructure and also economic and social development. So in addition, most of the gig workers, um, there's limited unionization, but they have platforms where they air their grievances. Some of them are using, uh, they're using WhatsApp groups, Facebook and so on, but others they have, um, a number of, of informal organizations such as the Ghana Online Drivers Union and what I didn't mention, the South African ELN Partners Council. So that is it. So the issue has been uh, employment law is trying its level best to regulate the gig economy by one redefining the gig workers either as employees or a new uh, category of independent workers extending the labor protection to the gig workers. But then on the other side, competition law, as many scholars have argued, has become a barrier to the enjoyment of better working conditions by gig workers. And there's a number of reasons. The main two reasons is that under competition law, we have what we call the labor exemption. And the labor exemption allows um, employees and employers to enter into collective bargaining agreements for better working conditions without having a liability under competition law. So when they enter into collective bargaining agreements um, on issues related to minimum wage, that one is not considered as price fixing under competition law. And the objective of introducing the labor exemption was that um, employees were considered to be vulnerable people and therefore they needed the protection. But then if you're a self-employed person, you do not benefit from this labor exemption. Therefore, gig workers that have been defined as self-employed people cannot benefit from the labor exemption. So they cannot enter into collective bargaining agreements with the digital labor platforms for better working conditions. Another one is that under competition law, we have what we call exemptions. So if you are able to show the pro-competitive gains of the conduct you are engaging in, then the competition authority is likely not to fine you or to allow the conduct to go on, as long as you show competitive gains. And some of the competitive gains we usually talk about is technological advancement, um, the participation of underrepresented people in the market economy. This is one of the things that South Africa has adopted regarding to historically disadvantaged people by ensuring that um, they can be able to participate in the market. Consumer welfare, increasing consumer choice is some of the issues that competition authorities will look at. So in this case, um, when it comes to gig economy, most competition agencies, when they were presented with cases relating to platforms, especially Uber or Bolt or Lyft in the US, engaging in competitive conduct like predatory pricing, they applied what we call the rule of reason, looking at the pro-competitive gains. For instance, for predatory pricing, most of them would argue that um, one, you have to show that the platform has dominance and then it has been able to abuse that dominance because predatory pricing falls under the abuse of dominance. And also they looked at the gains because when Uber and Bolt entered into the market, customers were able to get better alternatives at lower prices. So those are some of the things they were considering. So the solution has been that uh, 
There's need to extend the labor exemption to platform workers, but this will be determined by how we define the employment status of gig workers. And it can only apply under certain circumstances. And we'll see what the EU has defined as these other circumstances. And another option is not to look at this anti-competitive conduct as abuse of dominance because it's not easy to show the dominance of these platforms. So we look at what we call the abuse of economic dependence. Economic dependence under competition law refers to a scenario whereby undertakings or group of group of undertakings are dependent um, on other undertakings and there are no justifiable or reasonable alternatives for these undertakings. And also you can see uh, instances where, whereby the bargaining power of this uh, undertaking is equal. So in this case, you find that um, platform workers are economically dependent on the platforms they work for, and they do not have an equal bargaining power. So it will be easy for competition agencies to approach the issue of anti-competitive conduct among the digital labor platform market by looking at the case of abuse of economic dependence. In Kenyan law, we are talking about the abuse of buyer power. If you've had a look at the FCFTA competition protocol under Article 11, it talks all about the abuse of economic dependence in digital markets. So those are some of the provisions we may rely on as African. So what has some of the competition agencies across the globe done so far? And what can we learn from them as East African lawyers? So we look at two, three, Ireland, EU, and Denmark. So in EU, what they did, and this was um, after a case, I think Ireland must be knowing about it, about the FNV uh, case um, in Netherlands, whereby we had um, orchestral players and one of them, some of them had contract, but others were freelancers, so they would come when there's a job. But then it was realized that um, these other these other orchestral players that were coming, they were in the same situation as those that were employed. And therefore, the court came up with what we call the four self-employed people. These are people who look like the self-employed people, but when you look at their working arrangements, you find that they are in the same situation as employees. They don't enjoy any form of independence. There's no flexibility. And even if it's there, it's very limited and very rare. So after that, uh, the Ireland Competition Authority amended its uh, Competition Act in 2017, introducing new classification of self-employed people. So the genuine self-employed people or the relevant category of self-employed people, those are people when you look at their working arrangements, they are generally self-employed people. Then the false self-employed people, some people call the bogus uh, self-employed people and the fully dependent self-employed people. So if you are a false self-employed person, you benefit from the labor exemption. You can collect it again um, with your empl employer or the person has given you the gig for better working condition. So this is what they look at when they determine if a person is false self-employed, is in the same situation as the employee, they perform the same activity or service. They also have a relationship of subordination. They, they follow the instruction uh, regarding the time, the place, and where to work. And they do not share in the commercial, in the other person's commercial risk. And they have no form of independence as regarding the determination and time and schedule and place of where they are working. And then a fully dependent self-employed person is a person who is economically dependent on one or two persons. So the amount source of income does not come from more than two persons. Then those ones will benefit from the Ireland competition um, labor exemption. But then it doesn't, uh, it doesn't explicitly um, indicate that platform workers will benefit from this, but under section four, it provides them with an opportunity to apply to the Minister for Business, Enterprise and Innovation to recognize them as one. 
but the region that has been able to come up with explicit guidelines that uh, require platform workers to benefit from the labor exemption is the EU with the regulations um, being adopted in 2022. And it's very clear in the EU that there are certain conditions that have to be met. So this, this extension is not absolute. You have to show that one, the collective agreement seeks to improve the working conditions. So it is a relationship between the platform worker and the platform. So if they're entering into any kind of arrangement, it's between the platform and the workers to better the working conditions of these workers. If it's an arrangement between the platforms, and when you'll be doing module six, these are some of the case studies I give you to enable you to answer the module six quiz. It's very important to know that in cases where the platform workers on a horizontal relationship meet and agree to charge a specific commission rate, or they agree on market allocation, something, okay, you can operate in Kisumu while operating in Nairobi and so on. Those kind of arrangements are not geared towards improving the better working conditions of gig workers. And therefore they are not exempted from the application of competition law. So who will benefit from this? People who are economically dependent, and the EU has come up with a, a quantitative uh, description. If you are queen more than 50% of your income from one digital labor platform, and you should be thinking, oh, if someone is working for Global, how much do they get from this platform? Are they only working for Uber or Bolt, or they are getting from multiple um, other sources? And we've said that in where there's network effects, so this first mover advantage, um, gig workers will tend to work for only few platforms. So those that are also in a false self-employed situation, they're comparable to the situation of workers, will benefit. And also it has explicitly recognized the digital labor platform workers. And also as countries are reclassifying uh, who is an employee and a self-employed person when it comes to platform works, those that will be reclassified will benefit from this. So as um, I finish up, the competition authorities have already started um, interrogating these issues. And the first one to do so is Denmark. And in Denmark, what happened is that they have a platform called Healthfree, which provides uh, cleaning gigs, domestic cleaning jobs uh, for those who need them. But they have two categories of workers, those that have a contract with them, which they're called super healthy, and then they have the free freelance health friend. Those are the ones that um, just get jobs for specific time and that is so they don't have a contract. So healthy boss itself as a platform that uh, prioritizes uh, better working conditions of its workers. So it, it, in, entered, it entered the quality beginning agreement to the trade union in Denmark in order to provide um, better income for its workers. But then the competition authority came in and said, no, the freelancers cannot benefit from this because um, it because it was reducing competition among those uh, freelancers. So what the, the platform did was to give contract to those freelancers who needed one so that they could benefit from the better wage negotiation. So, in developing countries in Africa, South Africa had a, a chance to interrogate the issue of whether Uber was engaging in predatory pricing and it based its decision on whether Uber had a dominant position then and whether it abused its do dominant position. So it argued that uh, the predatory, that uh, the, uh, the, the prices did not lessen in competition within South Africa and Uber did not have a dominant position. And that's why we are seeing that um, if we rely only on the issue of abuse of dominant position, then we'll not be able to address the anti-competitive conduct within these platforms. So in a, in a nutshell and in conclusion is that um, competition law has a potential uh, to enhance the better working conditions of these workers but it will still narrow back to the definition 
and the employment status of gig workers as recognized in whichever jurisdiction. So there's need for collaboration among all these um, legal approaches from consumer protection, competition, employment, data protection, taxation, and other appropriate legal approaches. But at the end of the day, um, you find that the gig economy is has so many participants. So you cannot just lean towards um, one participant. So you're talking about how can we enhance uh, foreign investment in African markets? How can we ensure that homegrown platforms have a chance to grow within these markets? How can we ensure that the government also accrues revenue through taxation from these platforms, especially those that are established in the global north? And how can we ensure that our workers who are the most vulnerable and easily exploitable by platforms because they need job opportunities are also protected. And then for the legal practitioners, this is a new clientele for us that we need to start educating ourselves on the legal issues that are arising in the digital labor platform market, how to determine the legal status of these workers and other issues that are related to our areas of practice. And that marks the end of my presentation. Oh, and before I, I, I finish, uh, one of my articles, which focuses on the FCFTA competition protocol, has been nominated for an award in Washington, DC. And I think I've shared the link. If I've not shared, I'm asking for each of you to vote for me and also to share it within your networks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vera, for your presentation. Um, thank you for sharing me that, taking us through how um, the cause, the GAZ causes look like, and also for taking us through the competition um, concerning competition law and um, the potential and limits that there is. And also thank you for um, giving a call to action for to everyone and to lawyers in order to ensure we educating ourselves, but also bringing about a better and sustainable way of regulating um, gig economy. Now, one thing that is for sure is that we are um, in a digital economy, and that's something that cannot change. We need to find better ways to um, regulate, but at the same time for people to continue earning in, in ways that um, match the current situation in our countries. Now, uh, I'm conscious that we are running out of time, but there were questions that had already been posted in the chat. Uh, just to read, one of the questions was addressed to Miss Irene, and uh, Miss Ba asks, um, asks you to list those features that differentiate an employee from a worker. That was the first question addressed to Irene. And then um, an, another question that was um, also addressed, that was now addressed to Bella is that um, in what ways do gig workers contribute to fostering economic growth and GDP, especially considering their lack of regulation and absence of certain national benefits typically provided to traditional employees and workers? Um, Irene, I'm going to invite you to um, just briefly answer this question and then also um, allow Vela to also answer her question. Um, May, thank you so much. Uh, yes, thank you. Th thank you so much, David. Um, I've seen the question from my friend, uh, our Sue Mispa. <laughs> um, I'm happy to hear from you, Mispa, after some time. Um, my friend from Rwanda. Uh, so you're asking to differentiate those, so that I can differentiate those features that uh, you know distinguish between an employer and a worker. Um, I think you must have asked this question when I'm talking about the Uber case in the UK, 
uh, for them, their, their legislation is very specific. As I said, they, ha they have a specific provision that defines who a worker is. And, and of course, it's also they were dis contra distinguishing that with the independent contractor. Uh, but if so, if, if your question is in as far as that is concerned, um, I'm, I'm happy to share the the, the, the statute that draws uh, that distinction. But if your question was more general as distinguishing between an employee and an independent contractor or a self-employed person from an employee, then from a Kenyan perspective and even I think from many jurisdictions, from a common law perspective, I think Rwanda is civil law jurisdiction. I'm not wrong. Yes, uh, but from a common law jurisdiction perspective, we we usually refer to those principles that uh, uh, I think the dominant one is usually control or what in other jurisdictions are called subordination. Like for example, in the Uber UK decision, there was a lot of talk about subordination, which literally means that, uh, as I'd say, I'd mentioned or uh, alluded to earlier, that uh, the, the test as to whether an individual is an employee or not is the level, uh, or the level at, um, that the, the employer uh, really exercises upon that individual. So do they control their working hours? Do they control the manner and the nature in which they produce their work? Do they control their uh, their, their output? Like there is, in an employment relationship, that's the best way to know. Like, you know, you're controlling, they are coming in, you're controlling their, the, when it is that they leave, you control when they take leave, when they do not take leave, you control even the tools of trade that they use and so on and so forth. So all these um, um, are, are, are considered, and control test is not the only test that is considered from a common law perspective. There's also the integration, what they call the integration test, that is this individual so integrated into their into your business as such that they are then considered to be employees as opposed to independent contractors. Uh, but of course, we are talking about in the, in the gig economy, it, 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 the questions are being, uh, uh, you know, uh, are rising as to whether the control test is actually a proper test going forward. And this is really from, um, from it's a proper test to actually determine this relationship, knowing that control will always be there in such a gig economy. So th th those, those are some of the things that uh, we talk about. But also, you, I think, and I think Vela mentioned it, is that sometimes what what I think I really like that description that uh, false self-employed persons. I think from some jurisdiction, yes, sometimes, and even our Kenyan jurisdiction have actually addressed it that sometimes a label can be given to a relationship, but it's when you really dig deep, that is that label is not proper. That and that's where we call misclassification, such that you may you may label it as a self-employed person. You may yes, false self false self-employed people. Thank you, Fella. Um, so, so that you may label it uh, as a self-employed person or may label uh, this relationship to be an independent contractor. But all these principles need to be looked at to determine as to whether this is an employment relationship or, or not. And uh, when Dr. Goodluck was also speaking, I, I got very interested in what, what he was calling that re rebuttable presumption under the legislation in, in, in Tanzania, which reminded me that uh, even in our own jurisdiction and if you look at uh, our employment act section 2 defining contract of service it says means an agreement whether oral or in writing whether expressed or implied so it's whether expressed or implied what does that mean that an a contract of service could be implied depending on the circumstances of the case and in in the uber article that i wrote we go a bit di deep dive on what does this implication mean and how do you determine then the employment relationship um, uh, David, I know you've not really asked me, but allow me to chime in on the question about Churchill, <laughs> because I think Churchill is a Kenyan. Is like that, that is, I see Dr. Good, Good Luck has tried to answer it, but there's a question someone was asking about, um, I think that must have been the Churchill show. For, for, for non-Kenyans, the Churchill show is um, uh, a show where the, the, the main organizer really calls and arranges for comedians to come and you know, do stand-up comedy. And the question here being asked was, um, what is the question? The question was that uh, my understanding from the foregoing presentation that the gig economy is a sort of arrangement where a company or individual provides a platform for another individual to carry out an income earning activity. Correct me if I'm wrong. In the present past, we have seen former members of the Churchill show team take to social media and blame Daniel Dambuki with Churchill for unfair remuneration. Two questions are right. Uh, is is it right to say that the nature of engagement was that of a gig economy? 
and not employment. Secondly, can the comedians find recourse within the Employment Act? So I don't think it would be proper for me to give um, really sort of like legal advice one way or the other, because that more or less would be the case here. But how, how I look at it is this way, that, that this would really be fact specific, but it seemed from how it is that we know how Chachicho runs, it seems that they were being considered as independent contractors as opposed to employees in that sense, so that they, they were not reporting eight to five, they are not you know, entitled to leave, they are not entitled to such kind of things, from, from at least from just what I know from a public, uh, you know, uh, what is in the public domain. But of course, it would be public specific as to whether or not they can have recourse in the Employment Act, I, I really wouldn't say yes or no, but it would really be fact uh, uh, specific. So unfortunately, I've not given you a yes or no answer, but I would say it's really, fact specific, but from a general knowledge perspective, it seemed to me that there are more independent contractors than employees for that matter. I, I'll stop there for now, David. Thank you so much, Irene, for um, answering uh, both questions. Uh, I would like to now invite Vela to just quickly answer the last, the remaining question, in what ways do gig workers contribute to fostering economic growth and GDP, especially considering their lack of regulation and absence of certain national benefits typically provided to traditional employees and workers. And um, as you also address this question, I also ask you to give your concluding remarks and then we'll cycle back to Dr. Temu and Irene to give their concluding remarks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I'll be very brief in answering the question. So how do gig workers foster economic development? And as I had earlier provided the success of digital trade and any digital market ecosystem is underpinned by the availability of gig workers working for those platforms. So if goods have to be delivered, we have to have gig workers, um, issues related to financial payment as well. We need workers to work in the digital trade market ecosystem. So gig workers will spur innovation, especially in, in digital trade. It will spur business um, investment so maybe you're thinking about putting your car um, in the gig economy. Maybe you want to take some fuel rides. That is how it should work like. And they also foster business environment because um, the business uh, do not incur a lot of cost as related to the other employment markets. So because they have categorized um, the gig workers as self-employed people, you find that the cost of production is a bit low because they will not pay for the health insurance cover, provide the equipment to do their jobs and so on. And when it comes to what the government takes home, because of the growth of um, the digital market, um, a number of countries have been able to get revenue through taxation. So with more startups entering into the market and providing a job opportunities, they're also becoming a source of revenue. And we've, we've seen in a certain country where the president said, you can make dollars just uh, from your laptop. I think what he was um, meaning is that um, you can make money through gig work. So my summary and conclusion is that um, the future of the African gig economy is here and legal practitioners, we have to position ourselves for this new clientele that are emerging into our market. And we can provide uh, pro bono services if you want to, but we should be ready to know how we can defend both the platforms and also the platform workers. And I hope we are going to hear more especially from Irene Kashindi, because her expertise in, in, in employment law is just unparalleled, and I like following her work. Thank you.
Thank you so yeah. much. I don't know whether that was an invitation for me to, oh, David, go ahead. So I was wondering. <laughs> no, I was just going to invite you. So please proceed. Thank you so much, David. I was actually wondering whether Vela was inviting me. I, I must have misheard. <laughs> so th th thank you, D David. Thank you, Vela. Thank you, Dr. Good luck. I think for me, has also been a learning exercise. I have learned a lot from both of you. Um, for me, I think my, fi my final uh, comments really is that um, we all understand that the gig economy has indeed, uh, you know, come with its benefits. It has um, offered employment opportunities, and put money in people's pockets and hopefully uh, has contributed to economic growth. So as much as that has not been uh, regularized, I think we can take away the fact that uh, employment relationship has increased and has given people flexibility that the, the gig economy and platform work has, has, has provided in many, I mean, I think in many, many jurisdictions globally across the board. Um, but, but, but at the same time, of course, these discussions about uh, social protections and other protections from a labor law perspective uh, that should be extended to these uh, workers who work in the platform economy is not something that um, anyone can run away from. So anyone in the platform that you hear and you're listening from a perspective of a platform economy, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, person, I, I think you must you must uh, start considering what you must start thinking that this is not something that you will it will come <laughs> it will come and you have to get prepared for it and uh, but at the same time i think my, my parting shot really is that we need a proper striking balance um, that take takes care of um the interest of not stifling innovation and technological advances but at the same time ensuring that um, there's protection and there's uh, uh, at least basic minimum or even more than minimum to a certain extent uh, uh, protections that are extended to these uh, platform uh, workers. So that that is how I, I look at it, and I just um, pray that this and hope that these discussions and narratives will lead to you know um, advancements and uh, developments and trends that will uh, either result into case law and jurisprudence growth, but also legal reform. And I think what does it mean for us lawyers? It means work. So either you are defending a platform uh, uh, owner or operator, or you are defending the platform uh, um, uh, worker, or uh, you are you're looking at you know advising a union or a, a workers organization, employers organization, employees organization. I mean, there they is work for us as lawyers in this field, and I think it's something that we can all have a keen interest in and uh, uh, you know develop and uh, gain insights and knowledge. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Irene, uh, for your concluding remarks. I would now like to also invite Dr. Tim for his concluding remarks. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, in the interest of time, I wouldn't have much to say. But uh, one thing that is certain is that uh, the world is changing. Uh, we're moving digital now and um, gig worker or platform workers, uh, just one indication of how things are going to change and they're going to change very, very fast. We need to be innovative and find ways of accommodating these changes if we are to see any meaningful impact in our um, economy. So my, my recommendation would be for relevant governments to look into these things, uh, uh, probably make use of the available experts to analyze what can be done and what cannot be done, taking into account the individual economic assessment of um, a relevant country and come up with policies that can address these things. And if we can come up with uh, what I would call futuristic policies, even better, because we need to be able to foresee and accommodate what is going to happen in the next few years. And I think for those who are here, those who are present here, we have an opportunity to uh, uh, influence this change by speaking out, by speaking out what is right and by providing uh, the right and correct advice uh, to those who might need it, including government institutions and policymakers. 
thank you very much for taking your time in to listen to me. It was a pleasure being part of this seminar. Thank you, David. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Temu. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the other panelists as well, Ms. Vera Kigwiru and Ms. Um, Irene Kashindi. Um, it was a very insightful session and um, I really appreciate you taking the time to share with us all the knowledge that you have shared. And we'll hopefully the lawyers in this call have uh, have gained insights and are also going to heed to your call to learn to educate ourselves on gig economy, regula its regulation, competition law, and employment as well, so that we can um, ensure that things are moving towards a better direction in our current digital economy. Uh, I know there are a number of people who had additional questions, but I see that Vera has also shared her email. Um, I encourage you to reach out to her and to um, all the other panelists in order to ask to ask additional questions and to also um, engage for further discussions and to continue joining and participating in. Uh, webinars concerning this topic and other topics that are also organized by the East Africa Law Society. Thank you very much for joining today and for, yes, I also see that Dr. Temu has also shared his, his email addresses as well in the chat. So you can also get them from the chat and reach out to him as well. Uh, in, Otherwise, uh, I also thank you for joining um, the session, and I hope you've found it very useful, as I can also see from the chat. Um, I would like to now take this back to the East Africa Law Society for closing. Thank you very much everyone and have a great day.